Hello and welcome to Exam AZ 900, Microsoft Azure Fundamentals Online Study Guide. My name is Tim Warner. This is episode 19 of 50, and the episode is titled Azure Serverless Computing Products. We're working our way through the Microsoft AZ 900 Azure Fundamentals Blueprint. We start with the functional group Describe Core Solutions and Azure Management Tools. Actually, this whole section of the course, as you've probably noticed if you've been following these lessons sequentially, is we're touring a lot of Azure products. It's kind of a slog, but I'm enjoying it, and I sure hope you are too. <laughs> we're going to describe the benefits and usage of the so-called main serverless compute products in Azure Function Apps, Logic Apps, and Event Grid. Let's continue. First of all, as always, I like to set the stage to make sure you know what it is we're talking about in general terms before we take a look at touring the Azure products. Serverless computing is quite a buzzword that's thrown around nowadays. It used to annoy me because as an old infrastructure person, there's no such thing as serverless computing. There's always going to be compute under whatever kind of service, but that's not the exact point. The value proposition of serverless computing in any public cloud, not just Azure, is that developers have a platform where they can focus on their application and the functionality of their application and not the infrastructure. Recall earlier in the study guide where we looked at infrastructure as a service where you're responsible for everything. You're running your application in virtual machines and you have to back up and secure and optimize those VMs in addition to your application. You then can move more towards a managed approach like platform as a service. Azure App Service would be a good example there, where you have some control of the underlying virtual machine layer, but you're focused more principally on your application and your source code. Serverless is one step beyond that yet, where just about all of the compute infrastructure is abstracted away from you, and instead you're focusing specifically on your source code and what you want that code to do. Of course, as I said, in serverless computing, you still do have servers that are running the code. It's just that you don't have to tend to them much. So the first product, Azure product, that comes to my mind when I think of serverless is the Azure Function App. And the Azure Function App we could look at as code as a service or function as a service. You sometimes see those acronyms, C-A-A-S or F-A-A-S in the literature. And if you come from AWS, Function apps would be most closely aligned to AWS Lambda. And what we've got here is an event-driven code platform where you upload your code module. It's a raw source code. Could be in one of multiple languages that Microsoft supports, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, or PowerShell as of this recording in April 2020. But what I really want to hammer home here is how it works functionally, pun intended, and why developers like it. Look on the right and we see an event-driven architecture. Let's say you've got some IoT devices that are issuing their telemetry. Maybe it's a temperature sensor, so every so often a thermostat takes a reading, and that device could be configured to send or forward those events into an event hub. An event hub is sometimes confused with event grid, which we'll discuss in a moment. We could look at event hub as a hosted event telemetry stream processing platform. And in that event hub, we're bringing in potentially millions of these events from our IoT devices, let's say, for example. Well, we could use certain of those events as a trigger to kick off a function app. So why developers like this is that you can do what's called a microservices architecture. Instead of having a monolithic app where all of your logic is in a single monolith or code base, you can decompose your application into discrete functions and then have those functions just be sitting there sleeping in a sense. And when an appropriate event triggers the function, the function app wakes up. There's a few different pricing implications to how fast you want your functions to wake up, but that goes outside of our AZ900 scope. But the function runs, terminates, and then it's done. That function app can literally do anything because those supported languages, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, Python, and PowerShell, are all using the Azure Software Development Kit, or SDKs. So you're able to run code and maybe put those events in a Cosmos DB database. Dead letter messages, in other words, a subset of those messages can go to a storage queue. As you see in this diagram, the event architecture is a very popular programming model in Microsoft Azure. And function apps are extremely flexible. That's why developers love them. Now, Logic App also 
functions on the basis of an event trigger. However, it's quite different in terms of how you make these. With function apps, there's no question about it. You do have to be a programmer because you're actually hosting your raw source code in the function app definition. With logic apps, this is a graphical design surface that's similar to if you've ever used If This Then That, IFTTT, or Microsoft Flow, which actually uses logic apps under the hood. Those are no-code business workflow engines, where, for instance, you can have a Logic App trip off whenever someone mentions your company on Twitter. Maybe Logic App can be looking at Twitter, and then it could take a copy of that event and forward it via email or maybe create a message in your Microsoft Teams instance or your Slack instance. It's a no-code surface. Under the hood, your Logic App definition is in JSON, JavaScript Object Notation. And I'm going to actually go more into Logic Apps in a short demo upcoming, so I'll be able to show you that. Logic Apps are intended for Azure professionals who do need some kind of orchestrated workflow, but you don't have the resources, time, or willingness to invest in learning all of the REST APIs from all of these different vendors. Some of the ones I mentioned just a moment ago would be like Teams, Slack, and Twitter. They all have their own REST API definitions and normally require a whole bunch of learning to understand how they work. Logic apps abstract all that away from you. Azure Event Grid is a scalable managed event ingestion and distribution engine. Now, a couple slides back, I showed you a sample event workflow that used Azure Event Hub. Very common and appropriate question would be, what's the distinction between Event Grid and Event Hub? Both of them are very similar on their face. They're managed, they scale automatically, they can handle just untold number of events per second. It's a question of the data that's going into each of those resources. Event Hub is used for telemetry streams, where you've got, say, measurements from IoT devices, as I said before, where you've got this potential tsunami of messages coming into the Event Hub, and then you can subscribe to those messages selectively on the other side. Similar thing with Event Grid, it uses a topic model where those events that come in, which are not telemetry streams, that's really the main difference. Event Hub is what you use for telemetry streams. Event Grid is used for what Microsoft calls reactive programming, where you're just going to send discrete events, not time series events, but discrete events into Event Grid. Those are defined as topics. Every time, for instance, a virtual machine is shut down or restarted is a discrete event. Well, you can subscribe to those topics by creating what's called an event grid subscription. And the great value proposition that event grid gives is the flexibility on how you can handle those subscriptions. Check this out. This is a diagram from the Azure documentation. And we've got across most of Azure, you see on the left side of this diagram, these event sources, these are all Azure resources that produce periodic events. Service bus, for example, every time a message appears on a queue, that would be not a telemetry stream, but a discrete event. And a resource group, every time a new resource is deployed to a resource group or a resource is modified or deleted, same thing. Well, on the other side of that, as I said, you could subscribe to these event sources or topics and then pull those subscriptions, pull the events out of Event Grid into an event handler. And guess what one of the most popular, a couple of the most popular event handlers are right in Azure? You can see it right there serverless like Azure Functions and Azure Logic Apps. And so what we would do here is create an event grid trigger for either a Logic App or a Function App, and then we would run either the orchestrated workflow if it were a Logic App or the raw source code if it's a Function App whenever that event happens. All right, in this brief demo, I want to introduce you to some of the high-level features of the Logic App in Azure. As you can see in the view, we're in the Azure portal. I'm in the Logic Apps Blade, and I've created a Logic App called Twitter Logic App 1. If we select that Logic App, I want you to see a familiar interface, as we've come to expect, the Azure Resource Manager control plane. But then more specifically, I want you to see under Development Tools, we've got Logic App Designer and Logic App Code View. If I go to Designer, this is going to take us into that graphical workspace I told you about. Now, the situation here is that you're building an orchestrated workflow. You think about what you want to do. In this example, I thought, I want to be notified by email in my Gmail account, although it just as well could be Outlook or a business email. 
whenever a new tweet is posted that mentions Microsoft Azure. So instead of having to register an API key with Twitter and learn all of the REST resources and, and look at their methods and their routing, et cetera, et cetera, all I had to do is bring out a connector here, a Twitter connector, and I had the opportunity to sign into my Twitter account and I can just fill in the blanks here. I say in this case, I'm looking for instances of hashtag Azure and at, I'm going to make this a little broader and just make it hashtag Azure. So if anybody does a tag of this string, that's going to serve as a trigger for this logic app. Now, so what you're seeing here, this when a new tweet is posted is what's called a connector. You can see up on the toolbar, you can click out to connectors and it brings you to a docs article called connectors for logic app. I think you'll be really impressed what is here in terms of, let me just jump down. You don't have to do any programming because you've got built in connectors for just about every SaaS product, certainly most of the Azure products, as you can see on the screen right now. But if you scroll down further through the text, you can see third party products as well as Microsoft ones. Here's an example, Salesforce. So the idea is your sales department wants to have a Teams message show up whenever a new opportunity in Salesforce is posted. Well, instead of your developers having to understand their APIs, they can just, as an example, use the appropriate Salesforce connector right here in Logic Apps. Isn't that amazing? Let me show you. Let me go to New Step. And this is what the interface looks like once you've already got a trigger. The first step of the Logic app is to create the trigger itself, then it's going to be an action. And as you see, these actions can go across all these different categories. There's Azure as well as non-Azure options in these lists. Of course, Microsoft is going to show you all of the their own products first, but SAP and IBM and all of the code for these products is included in the definition of the connector. So this action, for instance, is going to run a mainframe program over a particular connection. Isn't that cool? So these connectors have potentially one or more triggers. This one doesn't. And then potentially one or more actions that can be run on the basis of a trigger. And you can just get rid of those steps graphically. You can rename these steps by opening up the ellipsis, as you can see. You can add comments. So this is a collaborative workspace as well. I had mentioned to you that in addition to the graphical workspace, you can switch to code view. All of the definition here for these logic apps is in JSON format, which is pretty impressive when you think about what's actually happening under the hood. But then when you think of what a REST API is, it's just a bunch of HTTPS calls, isn't it? Well, requests to be more specific. As you're working on a logic app, you can see and reuse any API connections that you created and just go on from there. To finish this up, I actually started this Logic app and I waited a few minutes and before too long, I checked my Gmail inbox and I saw this message. Uh, actually, let me go back to the Logic app one more time to show you how I did that. If I go to Logic app designer, I mentioned that I created a Twitter trigger such that when a new tweet is posted that mentions Azure, I then brought in the Gmail connector and I used the action send an email. And notice here, I want to draw your attention to the fact that these built-in connectors have dynamic data fields. So in this case, notice that I structured, let me scroll down, in the subject line, I just did raw text, tweet from, then I included the name field, posted, and then I inserted created at. In the body, I just did user and then brought in the dynamic field for the poster of the tweet, their geographic location based on what they have in their account, and then the tweet text, and then I have some text left over. This is just a bug. I need to get rid of that. I saved my work, and it's just going to run. When you choose to run it, the Logic app will just sit there. And notice that if we go through the settings, there's nothing here as far as resizing or restarting the underlying virtual machines. We're focusing specifically on the behavior of our application and Microsoft is handling all of the underlying infrastructure. So to come back to my original point, this is what my workflow looks like. When the Logic app tripped off and it sent me a message in my Gmail, I can see here tweet from, and then we've got the dynamic fill of the tweeter's name. And then of course, just like any other code, I probably want to go back and see if I can reformat the date and time to make it more friendly to the eyeball. That's pretty ugly the way it shows up by default. And then the combination of static and dynamic text in the body of the message here, use location, and then the raw tweet text. So that's a little bit on Logic Apps for you.
Our learning resources, as I'm sure you've come to expect, all come in the Azure documentation. For more information on Azure Functions, go to timw.info forward slash SCO1. For Azure Logic Apps, timw.info forward slash SCO2. And you could probably guess for EventGrid, timw.info forward slash SCO3. Cool, another lesson down. You're gradually working your way through this AZ900 material, and I can't wait to hear about your certification success. In the meantime, please feel free to leave any comments, questions, concerns, curiosities here on YouTube or Twitter as Tech Trainer Tim. You can watch my Pluralsight courses and my colleagues' courses at Pluralsight. Go to timw.info forward slash ps, and my website is techtrainertim.com. See you around. Thanks a lot.